now we're recording. Okay, but we're not missing too much. So the next thing is to add the stack pointer to the offset so that we have the address of pointer. <clears throat> and then the next thing to do is to do a LDBB so that we actually have pointer in this case in register B. And now we can check whether it is a zero or not. Now, instead of loading zero into another register and then do a CMP, because all we care is whether it's zero or not, okay? Um, the, quickest, the quickest way to do this is, use, is to use the AND instruction, not the OR. So AND BB is gonna force the register through the ALU, and therefore we can now use the Z flag. If it is you know, indeed zero, then we go to the end of this particular conditional statement. So using <clears throat> the same uh, labeling structure, I'm gonna say you know, uh, T underscore end if zero, which means it is the end of the first conditional statement at the outermost portion of this entire function, which is not really necessary in this case because we only have one single function anyway. We, excuse me, we only have one uh, control structure, so it's, it, it's not gonna be as complex as the one in the final exam from spring 2023. And you know, I know that I would forget to define the label. <clears throat> so I'm defining the label first here, which is really just you know right after right right before the return code. So whatever is in between, okay, I'm just gonna put a halt here. So depending on how I set up the test code in from main. It would either get to the halt instruction at the entry point because you know, the function returns without doing a single thing, or it would halt at line 30 because the pointer is not null. So this is how I can tell whether the condition of the conditional statement is working or not, whether the conditional statement itself is working or not. Okay, so here we go. So uh, make sure we save it first, and then we are going to test it. Um, so I made a, uh, I, you know, I made some changes to my system, so I can I can use submit in any folder now. So um, this is uh, traverse .ttp asm. And before we look at the result, okay, we have to kind of keep an eye on how main is calling traverse. So main is calling traverse with the address of n1, which is not null. So what should this program do? in this case, given you know, the code in Traverse looks like this. What should I expect? In other words, should I get stuck in the halt instruction that is in Traverse representing the then statement of the conditional statement, or should I get all the way back to the halt instruction at the entry code of the entire thing? Hmm? Well, I'm passing a non-null pointer. So according to the C code, <clears throat> okay, so let me go back to the C code first. So according to the C code, if the pointer is non-null, it would go to the then portion, but the then portion is a single halt instruction right now. So I should really stop at that particular halt instruction. Okay, so that's what I'm expecting. Um, I also should know, you know what these things should be you know, at this point. So if I look into the assembly code, I fixed everything you know, in the last email. Um, so based on what we are pushing on the stack, you know, we also want to know exactly what is on the stack. So that means you know, I'm gonna have to start up the tablet because it really is kind of the best way to show you, you know, what's going on. So let me get the tablet thing going. Um, Okay, so if I have to do this in the right order. <clears throat> That's CRCPY. Nope, still won't do it. Nope. One more time. Okay, now it's doing it. Alrighty. All right, so what we want to do is to figure out what should be on the stack at this point. And, okay, so, oh, wrong tool. There we go. All right, so we can start from the very uh, extreme of the stack, which is at location FF. 
the entry code is calling main, so that means that the first location of the stack is going to be a return address. It's the return address to go from main back to the entry code. That's you know, basically the first thing. And then we have the local variables of main. So we want to take a look at the uh, how the local variable of main are allocated. So you go to the code of main. And according to this, you know, we have a buffer size of five. The array is the first item on the stack. And then we have the um, array pointer. So that means array pointer should be here because it is the last local variable of main. And then the next five bytes together is going to be the array of five bytes. So these five bytes would be array. And you know, this is index zero, index one, index two, index three, and this is index four. And then when we call the subroutine, now we have to figure out you know, what else main is doing. So you can look at both the C code and also the assembly code. When you go to the C code, we have an un, we, ha we are initializing array pointer to point to array. So in the picture, okay, what we should see is array pointer, which is at location FE itself. And this is FD, FC, FB, FA, F9. So uh, if everything is allocated this way, that means um, FE, the location FE, should have a value of F9 because you know, the initialization wants the array pointer to point to the first element or the beginning of the entire array. So that's, you know, that, this is all done in main, okay, you know, because of the initialization. And then main proceeded to call the function. So when it calls the function, okay, let me switch back to the code. So when it does call the function in main, it is first pushing the address of array pointer, and then it pushes you know, the address of n1 on the stack. So what, what's happening here is it is pushing the address of array pointer on the stack. So that means um, fe is pushed here, and that becomes the parameter array in traverse, and then it pushes the address of n1 on the stack, and I can't really know the address of n1 unless I go to the assembler. So I'm switching to the assembler right now, and only to do the assemble tab because I don't want um, to know what is actually on the stack right now because I just want to I want to be able to predict you know, what it should be. So that means I'm looking for the definition of n1 as a label which is down here. So N1 is at location 1.5. So that's what I should be expecting when I look at this code here. So that means the 1.5 should be here. This is our, um, what is the name, PTR. And then we have another return address here. This return address allows Traverse, the first invocation of Traverse, to get back to main. So that's another return address here. So this time I'm not gonna look up what the return address is supposed to be. So we'll just kind of look at it this way. So the other thing we also want to do is to look at the frames, okay? Everything from here to here, that is the frame of main. Everything from here down to here, that is the frame of the first call to traverse. <clears throat> So I'm looking at the memory locations, I'm looking at uh, the content at those locations, and I'm also keeping track of where the stack pointer should be pointing to. So when everything is done at the halt instruction, the stack pointer should be pointing to the very last thing that was pushed. Yes. Yes, we are indeed recording. I did miss a little bit earlier, okay, maybe two minutes, you know, it should not be too big of a deal. Okay. So that means the stack pointer should be at, at F6 at this point, and I should have you know, certain values on the stack already at this point, okay? All right, so with all of this stuff you know, kind of predicted, now I can go ahead and look at the trace and see whether that is happening or not. I'm looking for overwriting, an overwrite of location FF, a overwrite of location FE with F9, an overwrite of location F8 with FE, and so on. All right, so I'm going to switch the screen to the analysis tab, which is actually the trace itself. 
And I'm focusing on you know, just this part. Um, FF being having the return address to 09 is correct, okay, because you know, we have been using that for a while now. The next update is location FE getting F9, and according to my diagram, it is also correct. And then the next update is location F8 getting FE as a content, that is also correct. And then we have location F7 getting 15, that is also correct. And then the next one is a return address, which I never really looked up in the code, but I'm assuming that is also correct. But, okay, so, so now that we, we look at this, we, we confirmed that the stack is kind of set up the way I expect it to be, but now I have to look at where does it halt, okay? Where is the halt instruction that stopped the entire program? And you can see here, okay, the halt instruction is on line 30. Um, and if we switch back to the code on line 30, that is indeed the halt instruction in the then statement. In other words, you know, um, the code is working as it should. But this doesn't mean your conditional statement is working because we have only tested one aspect of the conditional statement. So the next thing I need to do before changing traverse itself is to say, what if I pass a null pointer to traverse? It should not get to this halt instruction. Instead, it should just return, get back to main, main that has nothing else to do, and then it just gets back to the entry point, and then we should halt at uh, location nine this time, okay? So that's what I would do, okay? You know, since it doesn't really take that much time to change the program to test it again, so I'm just gonna comment out this, you know, just so that I know this is you know, what I changed a little bit earlier. So later on, I can change it back to whatever, whatever it should be. So save the program, <clears throat> and then just test it again. So this time, it should get back to line, I think, seven, which is location nine. So we'll, we'll check, we'll double check that. And it is, uh oh, did I do it correctly? Nope, I forgot to save. Nope, oh, because I used uppercase, so it, that didn't work. Okay, now we can try again. That was my bad. And I'm gonna switch back here. And you can see how it did not stop with a halt instruction, and instead it went on a little further, and then we, all, we got all the way back to line seven, and the stack pointer is back to zero, zero, so the program is working you know, up to this point. So what this is confirming is in the code, we know the conditional statement in C. The control structure is done, okay? We, we, we have not started with the, what is inside the then statement, but the conditional statement is done correctly. And it would seem that the evaluation of the condition of the conditional statement is also correct. All right. So I think I have already made some suggestions you know, in the previous week and also on Monday of how to proceed after this point. Um, I would tackle things that are not recursive, okay? In other words, at this point, I'm just gonna say, let's just comment out these two in even this one, okay? Because I just want to focus on one single statement at a time. If I can get that part done, then I'll move on and do something else. But until I can get that done, I'm not gonna do anything. So now the big question is, if I change the program like this, what is the C code going to do? Well, that's something that you can use GBD to find out, okay? Which is not a luxury in the final exam, but in the final exam, your focus is really just you're focusing on the, uh, the, the small micro aspect of coding and not so much on getting the program to work. If I grade the final exam, based on whether you can get the program to work or not, the whole class is going to fail. Okay, in most cases, the whole class is gonna fail. So it's not, that's not my grading standard for the final exam. So the final exam is really just find as many pro problems and fix them as possible. All right, so in this case, we need to go to GDB because you know, we want to find out what the C code is going to do. So, um, Compile the C code, GDB, traverse, okay. List the program. And what I would do is I am putting a breakpoint on that statement, the only one that I'm implementing. So that would be in traverse. And then we uh, put a breakpoint on 
oh, I have not commented the code yet, or the commented version is not saved. There we go. All right, so let's do it again because I forgot to save the code first. One more time. All right, so list traverse, and we want to put a breakpoint on line 15 because that's the only line I'm concerned about at this point. This is the only line that I'm trying to implement. So put a breakpoint here, run the program, and kind of make sure that we are still passing N1. Yep, so we are still passing M1 on line 37 to traverse. Okay, so the whole program is just doing one thing right now. Run the code. Okay, so now we are on this line. I know it's a little bit harder to see um, the... Okay, if I highlight it, no, that doesn't help either. Uh, okay. Is the color thing bothering you guys? I mean, if you cannot see it, you know, I probably should change the color scheme. Otherwise, you know, it's... Because I have to change it back later. When I go back to the editor, I have to change, change it back. But at least for now, it's okay. Okay, so the concern is, what is this line doing? So the first thing is, what is array? Okay, so we'll say print array. Array is, an, is the address of the address of an unsigned ABIT integer. It is something, something, five, uh, F50. But when you look at how it is passed, it is on line 37. So that means you know, what is known as array in Traverse is really the address of array pointer in main. Okay? Um, so we can track it down. So we, what we do, uh, there's one cool trick here. Remember uh, backtrace, BT? You can actually do a BT and then specify, I think, full. And what it will do is it will show you all the parameters, like PTR, array, those are parameters. But it will also show you um, the local variables, if there's any. So in this case, it's showing you array as a local variable of main, has these bytes in it, and array pointer in main has this particular value in it. But what it does not show is the address of array pointer of main. So, okay, so we still have to use the frame command to go back to main, and then we say, okay, tell me where is array pointer. You go like, oh, okay. So array as a parameter of traverse is really the address of array pointer in main. But what is array pointer in main pointing to? It is pointing to this location, which is uh, ending with F5B. But then when you look at you know, where is array in main, it is also at F5B. So this is how we know if the code is working correctly, that, loca that location is going to change. What is it going to change to? Well, let's take a look at what is PTR pointing to in Traverse. So right here, it shows you your pointer PTR of Traverse is really just pointing to N1. And according to the statement that we want to, we, want, we are tracking down, which is this one here, uh, right here, we are going to take the member value of the structure that PTR is pointing to, which is N1, so all we really need to do now is to figure out what is the value of N1, and it is a five. So we, we can now know that we are expecting five to overwrite the first element of array in main. That's what the C code is doing. This is not even assembly, okay? This is what the C code is supposed to do. So now we are ready to single step, okay? Single step is just S, and now we have to check, okay? So what we do is we go back to main, which means we have to change the frame back to frame one because it is not in traverse. We want to track what is happening in main. And we say, okay, tell me what is array bracket zero, which is the first item, the first element of array. Oh, it is a five, okay? So by doing this little experiment in C, using a C debugger, I now find, I figure out what we are supposed to change also in assembly. Is that okay? Because without knowing what the C code really means, it becomes difficult, not impossible, just difficult to write the assembly code. Now that we know what the C code really ends up doing, I think we can go ahead and try the assembly code. All right, so to do the assembly code, I have to change the color scheme back because I think the editor doesn't work well with that scheme like that. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, that doesn't work too well. Um, so I'm going to change it back to, I think it's dark pastels. Yep, so I'll just kind of keep this window around, but not where it is interfering with um, this main screen here. We're still recording. The screen is good. All right, so I'm just testing. All right, so now we get to the assembly code side and see, okay, now that we know what we should see when it runs correctly, let's see you know, how we can translate the code from C to, into assembly code. So this whole instruction has to go. Okay, You can still put it back at the end of the statement, but I'm going to let it go for now. So uh, as usual, I try to figure out the left-hand side first, uh, the right-hand side, sorry, right? figure out the right-hand side, and then we figure out the address specified by the left-hand side. You don't have to do it that way. It's just, you know, in most cases, that's how I do it. All right, so we have to get to the member value of the structure that pointer points to. So one way of thinking, and this applies to all of, all of your other classes too, is dependency, okay? What depends on what, on what else? Because you have to track the entire dependency tree and track it all the way down to the last thing. It's like, okay, this thing does not depend on anything else. We start with that, okay? So when I, when I use the phrase, okay, this is the value member of the structure that is pointed to by PTR pointer, where do I start? Pointer, right? The, the key is pointer. We are, we are not concerned about the member yet because we have to find the structure first before we are concerned about, so which member do we want? So we need to get to the, the address of the structure first, okay? But you're correct. Yeah, we, in order to do that, we have to rely on the offset that has the name of pointer, and then use that, use that to compute the address, then we get the value. Yep, mm -hmm. All right, so that's exactly what we're gonna do. LDI T underscore PTR, and put it into any register, because we don't have any return value whatsoever in Traverse. So register A is just as available as the other two, you know, B and C. Uh, remember to add the stack pointer to it, because otherwise it's just an offset. Now that we have that, we are interested in PTR itself, not where PTR is, but PTR itself is a pointer. So register A now has the address of a structure. So it is now time to think about, okay, which part of the structure do we want to access? Oh, it is you know, the member value according to the C code. So now we go use another register, LDI B with the offset to the member um, value. So that's gonna be based on the name node and um, value in this case. And then we add um, AB or BA. I don't think it matters in this case. Yeah, it doesn't really matter either way. So I'm just gonna add B to A. So now register A has the address of member value of the structure that PTR is pointing to. Okay. Are you guys still okay at this point? Hopefully, okay, all right. <clears throat> so um, that's great, okay? It, it's almost the entire right-hand side, except the right-hand side does not specify the address of the, of the member. It is specifying the value of the member. So this is one of the most important thing you have to overcome is in C and C++ to make programming easier when you refer to the name of a variable it automatically gives you the value of the variable. But in assembly language programming, you always have to figure out the address first before you can get to the value of something. So what seems to be an extra step in C, we're using the ampersand to get to the address of something, is actually easier in assembly because you always have to get to the address first before you can get to the value of something. So you kind of have to remember that because otherwise we think, oh, to get to the address is one extra step. That is not the case when you're programming in assembly. All right, so we do LDAA. Now we have the entire right-hand side figure out. The left-hand side looks kind of yucky because it is you know, double asterisk array. You just have to do it one at a time, okay? So that's also how you want to look at the syntax of the statement or the expression is do it one step at a time. You can look at a huge big mess, okay? 
but as long as you know how to read it, like you know, which part you have to go first, and then which operator to apply next, and then which operator to apply next to it, it's you know every step in the sequence is not difficult. You have to figure out the dependency first. Okay, so in this case, uh, looks like the first thing we need to do is to get to array, which is one of the parameters. So LDI, I cannot use A anymore, so I have to use B. This is the offset. This is the address. And this is the value, LDBB. So this is array, but that's not what we want, okay? Because we want double dereference. So this is the first dereference. And you would say, oh, that means you know, I need another D reference like this. No, because what this is going to do is to tell you what is currently at the byte that the pointer is, that A pointer is pointing to, and that pointer in return is pointed to by array. Okay? We don't care about what the value currently is. We, all, we want to override it. So that means you know, we do not want another LD here. Instead, we want to ST at this point. We want to store to register B, which is already pointing to a byte. And what we want to uh, use to override that location is register A, which is you know which we computed earlier, representing the right hand side. Okay, so that should complete line 15 by itself. So what should I do at this point? It's like oh okay, let's move on to the next line. Yeah. I'm just going to halt here because I want to check whether this is doing what it is supposed to be doing, okay? Because you know, it is entirely possible that I have one too many dereference or not enough dereferences or I do, do some stupid mistake for getting an add BD or something like that. So it's entirely possible, okay? I know what I'm supposed to do, but I can still forget to do certain things and the program doesn't work. All right, so save this. Go back to... The picture, okay? So this is important, you know, because we have to go back to the picture and say, okay, this time I'm going to use a different color, so just so that it's easier to differentiate, you know, what what is the new thing that we should observe here. That's what we should see, okay? The, that just that, okay? Nothing else is changing. It's just that location F9 should get a value of five, and then we halt, okay? So now we use. Um, Refer spider and say, okay, let's get out of the C code first and then submit uh, reverse.ttp ASM. <clears throat> question? Oh, okay. I thought you had a question. All right. So now we can check whether it does what it is supposed to be doing and I'm not sure whether I saved that code or not I think I might have forgotten nope I did save okay I think I forgot one thing um, I'm still passing a no pointer <laughs> it's like why is it not doing it yep okay there we go. And now we can go back and trace it again. All right. So now we go back to the assembler, and this time we should see another overwrite of memory locations here, and that's it. Okay, so it is changing location F9 to a value of 0, 0.5 and that matches what we are expecting the program to do. All right, so we got one statement done, okay? Um, we can move on to the next one. <clears throat> All right, so get back to the C code. So the next statement that we have to handle is this one here. All right, so once again, we want to do this in C code first, okay? Go through GDB, find out what it actually ends up doing. Um, and then we'll implement something in assembly, hopefully to mirror the same effect in the C code. So it's saved in the C code, and we do a GCC to recompile the program, GDB to debug the program, uh, list um, traverse, 
And this time, I don't have to stop on line 15 because we tested that already. So this time, we'll stop at line 16 and find out what it is supposed to do. Run the program, and now we get to this point. OK. So um, as usual, we, can, we are going to do a BT you know, full. Uh, it saves me some time you know, because it can show all the local variable as well. So if you have not taken CISP 400 or 430, this is a nifty trick, especially in CISP 430, where you have to write recursive code, because this will show you all the frames before the one that you're at and show all the local variables of all those frames as well. So this is a really, really useful tool to debug programs that have you know, uh, recursion in it. Anyway, getting back to this. <clears throat> All right, so what do we need to check? We want to know what this is going to do, okay? Um, so I'm gonna change the color scheme again because you know, this doesn't work well with this color scheme. Uh, go to color and we go back to the original color scheme. Okay, that looks a lot better. All right, so we are trying to examine what are we doing when we say whatever array points to is, you know, we're incrementing it, okay? But that's basically what it means. What is, what is array? Array is a double pointer. It is the address of array pointer of main. So that means, you know, when we say add one to whatever array is pointing to, we're adding one to array pointer of main, okay? So that's, that's what I'm expecting it to do. So that means array pointer used to be, okay, currently before I step single step this line, is pointing to F5B, which is the first byte of array. So that means if I single step, oops, uh, wrong window, where's my pointer, right here. So if I single step and do the BT full again, this time array pointer should, add, should, should be added to um, F. 5C, okay, the next available location. So we're gonna do again, BT full, and sure enough, okay, pointer of main is, array pointer of main is incremented by one so that it went from 5B to 5C. Now, all the other digits in hexadecimal is not really a big concern to us, you know, because you know, the Intel architecture has 64-bit addresses. Our own processor, TDP, only has 8-bit you know, addresses. But the point is, it is incremented by one, okay? So looking at this effect, and then looking back to our picture here, the question is, um, so which byte should be incremented by one? What do you guys think? What is the location that should be incremented by one? FE, F -E, yep, location FE should now change from F9 to F8, okay? So that's the one additional change we should be expecting if we are to do this in assembly. So now we switch back to the <clears throat> assembly code and I have to change the color scheme back to what works for us. And I'm trying to look for that screen on my other side. I cannot find it. Hmm? Question? Yeah, I know. I'm trying to change it back to the other color scheme. Okay, there we go. Color, go back to uh, dark pastels. Hmm? That is a good question. I know that I'm using, well, we'll give it a try when we get back to uh, GDB. Or have GDB to stop using uh, color highlighting. Mm -hmm. That might actually be an easier thing to do. I'll look into that. Like when we, next time we get back to uh, GDB. All right, so now we are back getting back to the assembly code of Traverse. And we are adding something in front of the halt. I'm gonna keep the halt instruction here just so that I have another place to stop to double check that the assembly code is doing the same thing as what the C code is supposed to be doing. All right, so right-hand side, left-hand side. But this one is a little bit different because if I need to get to the value of whatever array is pointing to, I can now use one register to get to the value and then the other register to continue to point to the location. 
So I can use two different registers and that can help save a little bit of time. But regardless of the approach, I still need to get to T array first. So I'm not reusing things you know, from before. I could have, okay? So I could have saved the register up here and reuse it here, but I'm just gonna recompute the whole thing. So we have the offset, we have the address, we have array, okay, LD, AA. So now we have array itself, and <clears throat> we are trying to access what the value at that location. So I'm gonna put it into a different register now. Because array, I still need array by itself because I need to change whatever array is pointing to. So the value of array needs to be retained in a different register compared to the value that it is pointing to. So B is the uh, value of, okay, I'm gonna give you a little clue here. B is this. A, on the other hand, is just that. So now we have to add one to the value that is pointed to by array, which is in register B. Increment B would do the same, would do, would do that trick. And then we have to store it back. So that means you'll store back to wherever register A, A, register A is pointing to, and that would complete the increment. Yep. Oh, pff. yep. So increment uh, B, not D. There we go, thank you. All right, so I'm just gonna do this, okay? I suspect that you know, we have line 16 of the C code done at this point. I keep the halt instruction here so that I can go back to the picture. I can locate that one single change that we should be seeing and make sure that it does happen. Okay, so let's go back to the picture. We are expecting location FE to change to um, FA. Okay, so this is the change that I am expecting and the code is supposed to do that. So what we'll do now is really just to make sure the program is saved and then just run it again. Okay, this is GDB. I'm done with GDB at this point. And go back to the assembly debugging tool. All right. So now we get back to the oops, wrong browser. There we go. All right, so the next update should be what I just you know talked about. Location FE should change to FA. There we go. All right, so that works out. So if I had that bug, you know, if I did not fix that bug, I would not see this, right? You know, instead register D would have changed. So I would I would basically stop right away. It's like okay, I'm not seeing what I'm supposed to be seeing, but the number of lines I have introduced is like what five lines or so. So that means you know, I only have five lines to debug. It's like, okay, did I do it right here? Did I do it right here? It's a lot easier to locate a bug when you only have five lines to suspect that something is wrong, okay? All right, so we are close to done. I mean, you, know, you guys are going like, but you haven't even done the recursion part. The recursion part is actually the easiest part because whether you're calling something recursively, meaning that you're in the function that you're calling or you're calling from a different function, makes no difference. The caller callee agreement does not change because you, whether you, you know, does not change whether you are calling recursively or not recursively. So now I can focus on, okay, let's start with uh, the recursion here. And I'll just you know, do one recursion at a time. So we'll change the C code. So it's like this go to the assembly code, go to the right place to make that change because that recursive call is supposed to happen before the code that I have written at this point. So now we have to look at this code and go like, okay, how do we do this? It is almost easy, okay? You know, there's one little trick that you have to remember. <clears throat> That's the offset, this is the address, and this is my, this is array itself, you know, the value of the parameter. I'm just passing it along to the next invocation so we have to push it on the stack. Okay, that's done. But one thing you have to remember, and I suggest you to have some way to track this kind of thing in the exam, is now we have one extra thing pushed on the stack. So in addition to the frame that was demonstrated earlier, now we got one extra thing on the stack. So that means when you need to get to pointer, PTR, it is one byte off from what the label is suggesting. 
So that means at this point, I have to go to um, you know, TPTR one plus. Okay, now because that one byte is static, which means you know, we're only changing the offset by one byte, I can uh, roll that increment by one into, um, into the expression of the LDI. I don't need to have another increment instruction. So otherwise, you know, other than this, it's kind of the same deal. Um, add AD, this is now the address of pointer, um, LDAA. This is pointer itself, which is the address of a structure. We want to get to the value of the L member. So I'm going to use another register, say B, <clears throat> for the offset. So this is node underscore L. And then we add um, B to A or A to B. It doesn't really matter each way. Each way is fine. So I'm going to add B to A. So A is now the address of member L of the structure that pointer points to. Um, we don't need the address, we want the value. So we need one D reference at this point, LDAA, and then push it on the stack, decrement D, STDA, and now we are ready to push the return address. So LDIA dot six plus, decrement D, ST, oh, yeah, STDA. Now we have the return address also pushed, and now we can JMPI to traverse. And then when we get back, we have two extra things sitting on the stack. So we need increment D, increment D to get rid of the two bytes of arguments that are still sitting on the stack. And that should be it. So this is really a long chunk of code. Um, I probably should test it. So now the question is, what do we do to test that part of the code? So that's why, that's, I, I hope you guys remember when I said you know, debugging the code, you, know, you don't want to use N1 to debug this because, it, because the left of N1 is N2, the left of N2 is no. Okay, I guess that would still work. But it is probably better to use something that has no left, okay? In other words, um, N4 or N5 is perfect for this because neither has a um, non-null you know, left. So that means the recursive call would have done nothing. Um, the code would have done exactly the same thing as it did before. Okay, so and I have to take out the halt instruction too because otherwise the the most inner recursive call. Um, no, I don't have to take out the halt because the recursive call is going to pass a null pointer. So that means the you know, the recursive call itself would not hit the halt instruction. It will still get back to the first invocation and hit the halt of the first invocation. So the trace is going to look longer, but when it comes to you know, what location it's going to change, would not change at all compared to what we have now. But that's only if I change to uh, use N5. Or, yeah, N5 is fine. N2 would also work in this case. Um, so I have to change the program a little bit. Because I, N1 is going to be, it would do, we we'll try to do it really recursively, and um, I mean that's kind of up to you, you know, which one you want to use, because you know, you kind of have to know what the program is supposed to do in the C code. You can always try that out, okay, in the C code and see what it is going to do based on the changes that we have done so far. So that's also you know an option. All right, so we're changing main to use N2, and I will do exactly what I said, which is you know, changing this one also to just N2, and try to figure out in the C code what it is going to do. All right, and because we have a halt instruction here, I am going to, hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put a breakpoint here, so this way I can I know where it's supposed to stop. Okay. All right, so the C code is done. The assembly code is should match the C code at this point. So it's now, now time to uh, use GDB, so GCC. But now I want to look at GDB, and uh, it does not have any man pages. That is odd. That's okay. And we'll do a help, um, help all. Disable pretty printer, maybe. Or I can do what usually what everybody does, just Google. 
GDB, um, no color syntax highlighting, syntax highlighting. There we go. Okay, disable, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's go. <laughs> I like these answers here because, yes, I know I should have done that. <laughs> um, okay, so the answer, someone is, you know, kind enough not to just say RTFM and say set style enabled off. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'll teach you one other trick, okay? For those of you who really want to know these tricks, you know, there's another trick here. So the other trick is to go out of uh, GDB and go to a, use a file called GDB init. So the GDB, GDB init file starts with a dot. That is not a typo. So it, this is what we call a hidden file in Linux, which means you know, when you do a ls normally, it doesn't show up because it's a, it's a special file. This is what GDB will automatically run every single time if you specify commands in this thing, okay? So the trick to, is to put it here and you put that command that we saw earlier, which is what? Set style enabled off. Okay, I'm too lazy to remember all that. So I'm just gonna copy and paste. Copy and paste. There we go. All right, so the moment of truth, does it work? Okay. And all right, so it looks a little different. Auto loading has been declined in by your auto load save path set to blah blah blah. <sighs> all right, fine, we'll just do it manually. Hmm? Yeah, I did. I thought I did, otherwise, it wouldn't complain about this. Yeah. Okay, but now it should be off. Okay, we'll 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 see. We'll we'll check this out whether that works or not. So list traverse. Aha, that works. Yes, the Klingons would have said kapla. Success. Mm -hmm. Break on line sixteen. Okay, because that's the line that we want to stop at. All right. So run. Okay, and we. Probably want to put a break on a break point on line twelve too because I want to show you the second invocation and how it doesn't get into the then statement. All right, so run the code. This is the first invocation. There should be a second invocation. Oops, not nope, nope. We don't want to run it again. Say no. We want to continue. There we go. So now this is the second invocation. If you don't use backtrace, it's really hard to see what is going on here. Okay. But if you use backtrace, bt full, oops. Now you can see that, oh, okay, there are two invocations of traverse. This is the last one. This is the very last invocation where pointer is null, as expected, okay? This is the first invocation where, where pointer is not null. In fact, it is pointed to n2 because that's the way we called traverse from main. Is that okay? So in the second, in the most recent invocation, because pointer is null, that means it's, it should skip over the entire conditional statement, just return right away, okay? Single step, yep, it, it skipped all the way from line 12 to line 19. It skipped the content of the entire conditional statement. Then it goes back to the previous invocation, which is um, this invocation here which will do the usual thing that it did you know, last time because you know, it's not, we, we have not updated anything. So after we go back here, it would just do the usual thing, this and that, which is basically all we did. Is that okay? All right. So now we can say, okay, if we do something like this in the assembly code, it should do exactly the same thing as what we are seeing here, even after we implemented the, the recursive call. So we go back to the assembly code, okay? Just double check one last time that we do have the recursive call done, okay? We have the call, we have you know, increment D, increment D. Okay, that looks good to me. Um, make sure it's saved, it is. Then we get out of GDB and then we do the assembly debugging, okay? So it will take longer this time because of the recursive call, but in terms of the memory location updates, it should be the same as last time. In other words, what is in this picture should be exactly the same. All right, so now we go back to the assembler 
and it's now done updating. So you can see how it's doing the recursive call. It's pushing more items on the stack. And then when it returns, we go to location F9, change it to a three. And that's because we're using N3 this time. N3 has a value of three, so that's why it is updating to a three. And then um, location FE should also update. You know, should increment to FA. So we should see that this time too. All good. And we are halting, you know, right after that because I did not remove the halt instruction because I said, you know, we just wanted to stop right away so I can test the code. All right. Are we still doing okay so far in terms of, you know, following the, not only how the program works, but also, you know, how to write the code. You know, doing it really, really step by step and checking everything along the way. It is tedious, okay? But if you don't do it this way, it would take you even longer. All right, so do you guys want me, are you being, yeah, are you getting sick and tired of this really long process and just want me to just finish the whole thing and show us you know, what it's going to do? Keep going, okay, all right. Okay, so if I were writing this program the first time, I would now change the N2 to um, N1. The reason why I would do this is because N1 has a left of N2, and then N2 has a left of zero. So this time the behavior would have changed a little bit because we would have two values written to um, the array in main, and then array pointer would have incremented twice. Okay, so that's, you know, it's different this time. So, um, all right, so let's do it this way. Since you guys said, you know, it's okay to do it a little bit longer, okay? So GDB, uh, list, traverse, and we'll put a breakpoint on line 12, okay, as usual. And we also put a breakpoint on line 15 so that after the recursive call, we want to get a chance to stop as well. All right, so we run the code. The first time it gets to the breakpoint, this is the first invocation and it stops at the conditional statement because pointer is not null, it's gonna go through, it's gonna go to the conditional statement, uh, the then statement. And then this is the recursive call because traverse as a recursive call is the first thing before we put a, uh, we have the second here breakpoint. So this is the recursive call and you can see that it is also non-null. And then we continue one more time. And this time it is null. So when we single step, this will skip the entire then statement. It will just return. And this is you know, the first time we get to the overwrite. But it's overwriting, um, it's overwriting the first element of the array in main using the value of n2. The value of n2 is three, okay? So we're expecting three written to the array first. So this is right away, okay? Right away, I'm going to my code here, okay? And we say, try a different color. Um, let's try green. So this time, we know that you know, we're expecting a three here first because it's the first overwrite. And then you know, um, F9 changes to FA at location FE, you know, out of the first one. So let me just kind of make it more obvious. So it will change to FA first and then go back to the debugger. Um, so single step, single step. This is going to return from the second invocation of Traverse back to the first invocation of Traverse, okay? I know that because I can track recursive algorithms, but if you cannot track the recursive algorithm, BT full is really helpful, right? Because it tells you right away, oh, I forgot to change the uh, no syntax highlighting thing. But it's okay, I mean, the line numbers are clear enough to show us where we are. So we have two instances of Traverse right now. We are about to end the, the last call to Traverse back to the first call of Traverse. So single step, we're now back to the first call of Traverse. So at this point, array in Traverse, which is a pointer to array pointer in main, should be pointing to location uh, the next location, so it's going to overwrite it with the value of N1. What is the value of N1? We, we did that earlier. It's a five, right? So that means that we should now overwrite 
the second element of the array local variable of main using a value of five. Okay, single step. And you go like, well, okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, are we really sure that is happening? Three, five. And then the next thing we're going to do is to increment whatever array is pointing to. So that means you know, the 5C should become a 5D, which, is, which belongs to array pointer of main. So single step again, do another backtrace full, and you can see how it moved from 5C to a 5D. Okay, so that's about all you know, we need to do, okay, um, you know, what we are tracking. But in the assembly code, it is a little bit different this time because what I need to, I cannot have that halt instruction anymore. Uh, the first thing I need to do is to change this N1 to N2 to N1. But the other thing I also need to do is to get rid of the halt here because if this halt is here, it will stop at the last recursion or the second recursion, I should say. It will stop at the second call of traverse it will never have a chance to go back to the first one to do what it's supposed to do. So now I have to uh, have a leap of faith, okay? And if people who are religious say that this is not the right use of the leap of faith, I'm sorry. But I'm taking a leap of faith here because you know, it is still you know, having faith in my own ability to write this code or the, whatever is left of this code correctly. So it is a kind of faith. All right, so now we go to the assembly code is all done. Um, we'll go ahead and test it. I have another phrase in my head that I'm about to use, but I go like, nah, that's, uh, that's enough religious stuff for a day. <laughs> Starts with a J. Um, all right, so now we check the um, trace in the assembly code and make sure that we are making changes you know, in the right way. So we are seeing that this is the first overwrite of the first element of array. We are incrementing array pointer of main. This is the second byte. It got changed to a five, just as we expected. And we increment the pointer one more time. So I'm pretty sure this is working, okay? So we just have to be sure and make sure that we get to the actual halt instruction with the stack pointer being a zero. So I'm done with one recursive call. What do you think the second recursive call is gonna look like? Yes, yep, exactly. So at this point, it is not too big of a deal anymore, okay? The, the code is almost done. So what I can do is another split there we go see don't you like bi it allows you to split it this way and then split this way and then it, you, you can actually chop it in any way you want um the, the reason why i have to do this is because i have to find out which lines to copy and then the other one on the in the other window i'm going to specify where so this is line 24 to 52 24 to 52, okay, 24 to 53, yeah, 53 is better, yank. And then over here, we have to go to the location, which is right here, and do a paste. There we go. And then copy and paste is all good, and you have to, you have to remember to change what is supposed to be changed, because otherwise it's gonna go to the left branch twice, which is not the intent, which is not the intention. All right, save, come on, lowercase, there we go. All right, so I have to do a matching change to the C code, which means you know, we are now going back here and uncomment the last, the second recursive call. So I have already demonstrated what the C code is supposed to do with both recursive calls here present. Um, basically, array of main is gonna be the sorted, sorted order of three, four, five, nine and 10. And then the array pointer would point to one byte past the end of array of main. So we have checked that already, um, I think, uh, when the assignment was assigned. So now we can go to, uh, oh, wrong window. We can go here and just debug the assembly version. So getting back to what it's supposed to look like, 
So that means that at this point, we're expecting three. Um, okay, let's use yet another color. <clears throat> so this time, when everything is in place, we are expecting this to be three, five, and then what? <laughs> I, can't. I cannot remember the, uh, the values. Three, five, uh, oh, three, four. Okay, that's a four. Okay, never mind. So three, four, five, nine, and 10, which is an A. And then this eventually will get to what? It will get to F, E. I think those are the things we are supposed to see, you know, the ones in the future, I guess. Okay. All right. So let's see whether that is happening or not. Okay. So we go back to the assembler and look for those updates. Uh, these are these are coming from the recursive calls. Um, F A gets four. That's correct. Okay. We F9 getting a three is already has already happened. Um, incrementing the pointer. These are all from recursive calls, recursive call, recursive call. Oh wait, that's a that's an increment of array pointer. And we have the five stored. Okay, so this is the third element of the array. Um, and then we have recursive call again, recursive call. This is recursive, 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 and recursive. Uh oh. Okay, this is correct. So um, FC getting nine is correct. I'm I'm double checking on my side. You cannot see it, but it, it is correct. Um, and then FE would increment again to FD. Okay, that's all good. And then recursive call, recursive call, and then this is the last element getting an A. So that is correct. Uh, the array pointer gets incremented again, so it ends up pointing to itself. That is just coincidental, okay? That is just coincidental. And then after that, we should have, you know, just a bunch of returns all the way back, okay? And so you can see how, you know, the stack is decrementing, the stack pointer is incrementing. So we are almost done, and there we go. All right, so the whole program is done. All right, so what is the main challenge of this homework assignment? Or do you find it challenging? Because some people may not find it very challenging, just a little bit. The what, the recursive part? Did you do it this way? Did you do it without the recursion first and then get the two statements done first before you introduce the recursion? Because that's one way to, to do it too. So the complexity of this homework assignment you know, partially has to do with how do you debug it? How do you test to make sure that your assembly code is mirroring the code of the C, the, the code in C? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. So drawing a picture can be helpful in that case. So if I were to switch back to this picture here, so somewhere else in memory, okay, down here, let me switch back to the default color. So somewhere down in the memory, you have the actual, you know, N something, right? So let's just say we're dealing with, I don't know, N3, okay? So N3 has a value, it has a left, has a right. So the right is pointing to something else, the left is pointing to something else, if it is not zero. So that's, so that's a pointer. But the other, there, we have a lot of pointers, right? Because um, the parameters, this is a pointer, this is a pointer um, to um, um, array pointer itself. So this is a pointer to, okay, let me see how, what is the best way to represent it? Right. 
that's a pointer. And then PTR, okay, you know, which is, okay, this PTR is a pointer. It points to the beginning of a structure. So this PTR points to the beginning of a structure, whatever you know, is, the, is the parameter at that point. Yep. So, so once you have this picture, then the idea is to track the registers. So, you know, when you, when you, okay, so a statement like this, LDI A with T of PTR, <clears throat> what is loading is the offset between where the stack pointer points to, which is here, and where we can find PTR, which is here. So this instruction is really just putting one into register A, which is not the address. But once you add the stack pointer to register A, AD, then register A now points to here. In other words, you know, with those two instructions, we are going to have register A pointing to this location. But it doesn't have the value of that location, so it's just pointing to that location. So that means you know, if the code is looking for PTR itself, then you have to dereference A, but when you dereference A, then it becomes the address pointing here. In other words, once you figure out the arrows, you're basically tracking which hop am I doing with all the arrows, you know, linking things together. Each dereference is following one hop. So having a picture like this you know, can be helpful you know, when you're, you're trying to figure out what the code is doing. But at some point, okay, you should be able to, I mean, it might take some practice, but at some point you should be able to look at the C syntax and just break it down one step at a time. It all, it's also helpful, okay, let me show you that too. Um, you're gonna have to do it anyway in the final exam, is you, you have to track down what is in the register after each of these instructions that would change a register. So tracking it properly is important. And this is why you know, I have always been giving you code that has no comment in it because I want you to go through the lecture recording and then spend some time, okay, not just you know, copying what I said, but thinking about it and go like, okay, am I understanding what is in this register now? And then use your own documentation, use your own words to kind of explain what is in a register after an instruction. All right, any questions? So we have our exam next Wednesday um, at, what, 10.15, I think, for this class. So make sure that you show up at 10.15 so that you don't lose any time in the final exam. Uh, the final exam is two hours long. Um, and it's going to be a very similar style to the final exam from last semester. I send you guys the file with all the solution of the final exam so you can I, I, I would study it you know, to a certain extent, but I would not say, okay, these are the same things that tech is going to use. I just have to look for these patterns. So do not look at it from that perspective, okay? Because I can assure you it's not going to be the same pattern, okay? It might be the same. It might not be the same, okay? The idea is you should be able to look at any program in C and the corresponding C code and figure out, okay, I know this, what this is supposed to be doing, but is it doing what it is supposed to? You have to be able to track down the registers and the instructions to find out whether it's implemented correctly or not. All right. Are there any questions? Are there any questions about the final exam, about the concepts, about the approach of, you know, the, the approach of getting the program done is not really that relevant anymore. But the approach to you know get to the exam you know is important. So are there any questions about that? Okay, if there are none, I just have a few tips. The first one is for people who write really large letters. Your handwriting is on the big side. <laughs> you might need to practice so that you can fit the comment on each line. Okay. Um, Bringing a ruler with you may be helpful, okay, so you can line, you know, the paper and then just kind of write on each line. That can be helpful. Um, 
color coding can be helpful to some people. I'm not sure how many people feel you know it's useful. Um, drawing the stack, okay, that is useful. So let me switch back to the diagram. So being, I'm, this is how I would do it, okay? You might have your own way of doing things, but <clears throat> to many people, looking at a picture of how things are laid out can be useful, okay? Now, how useful it is to you is up to you. I cannot, I, that part I cannot say, okay? I cannot assess, you know, how much this is going to be useful to you. Um, you can bring you know, all the sample programs that I have written in the past. I don't think it's a good idea to go through the sample code you know, during the final you know, to try to look for something you know, because you know, that, can be, that can take you a long time. But you can bring it with you just in case, okay? So you can bring all of that. Um, I would say the caller callee agreement is probably the one single most important document that you probably want to bring with you just in case there's one little thing that you want to clarify or make sure, but you really should have understood all of that by now. Um, I don't know what else. I mean, there are not really a whole lot of definitions. Oh, how we translate your know, control structure into assembly code or flatten those your know, control structure may be helpful, okay? So you can bring you know, that particular module with you, print it out, bring it with you. Um, Post-its, you know, little post-its you know, that you can stick on the exam itself so you can kind of annotate, okay, I'm still working here, I'm looking for the end of this thing, you know, so you can you know where to go back to. That can be helpful. Um, I really cannot imagine anything else. I mean, highlighters, um, different colors you know, of your know, pen or you know, ball, pe ball pens, ball point pens, okay. Um, I cannot think of anything else. I don't think a calculator is particularly useful in this one. Yep. So in the past, I do not tell people how many. I can do that. I'm not sure whether that's going to be helpful or not. Because correcting the wrong code is going to take points off. You know, that, that's going to deduct points. Not one for one, okay? You know, I think usually I use four for one. So four incorrect, four wrong corrections is worth one point. But each correct, each correct correction is also worth one point. So you know, people can, can try to do the shotgun approach. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just randomly make some changes, um, randomly add some instructions, and randomly you know, cross out some instructions. That usually won't work out, you know, but I can still tell people how many um, you know, bugs or how many points there are to address. Okay. Then I have to say, okay, because sometimes you, know, you can have a chunk of missing code. Does it count as one or does it count as three, right? So you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to clarify that because otherwise some people may say, okay, you mentioned there are 19 flaws in the program, so, but these three instructions are missing together doing one single thing. So in my view, it is counting as one single error, but some people may count it as three different errors because there are three lines of it. So that's the downside of giving people an exact number to look for because they can miscount it. All right, anything else? Oh, office hours. I still have office hours after tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last day of instruction, which means you know, there will be no class on Monday or Friday or Tuesday or Wednesday or next Thursday. But I have office hours on every day from 8 to 9. You know, um, so if you want to stop by and talk about these concepts, you know, I will be available. Um, if you cannot make it to that time, you can always you know, schedule for a appointment. So I can still also make appointments you know, based on your availability. Um, I really cannot think of anything else. I mean, you guys can also watch the uh, video from the Tuesday, Thursday, Thursday class, you know, because sometimes I do things slightly differently. So you might notice things that I may not have mentioned in this class or you know, in the way that you understand. So you can always do that too. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to add. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. 
So basically, when you look at a real compiler like GCC or the Microsoft compiler, um, they basically all we are doing in this class is be becoming the human compiler. But the concepts that I'm teaching here is usually found in real compilers. Um, they change things a little bit, you know, because you know, uh, for optimization, some of the later compilers will try to use all the registers first for passing parameters before they resort to use the stack. Um, so they do optimizations like that with, now that we have processes with more general purpose registers, they can afford to do that. But before, you know, they, they, don't have, they don't have so many registers, so you cannot really use registers for passing arguments. Um, so they do have some changes you know, based on <clears throat> the, the characteristic of the architecture. But for the most part, the concept that we talk about in this class is pretty common in you know, normal compilers. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So I don't have anything else to add. Um, I can stop the recorder, you know, push the video online, and you're welcome to stay here, you know, but there's no homework to do anymore. So if you want to review the concepts and just stay here, it's good. If you want to go like, okay, for the first time we can actually get out of this class, you know, before noon, you can also just <laughs> take off and have your lunch. All righty. So I'll see you next Wednesday at 10.15 for the final exam. Um, have a nice weekend, and I hope you guys will find an effective session studying for this class.